Well, I've been waiting for this rumored Dirac Live room correction update, but it doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon, if ever. So I figured it's time to drop the review. What's going on guys? Before we kick off the video, if you're into audio and video gear like new processors and new movies, then hit the subscribe button for new weekly videos. All right, so I'm gonna knock out two reviews in one video. So if you've been following the channel at all, you might know that I've got an entire Rotel home theater setup here. I used to run their 10 series amplifiers, but now I've moved up to their 15 series amps. Actually, I still use the 1075 to run my high channels. I've also got a review up for the 1592 channel amplifier that's running my left and right speakers right now. I'll leave a link for that video at the end of this one. Powering my center, side, and back speakers is the 1585.5 channel amplifier. And of course, handling all the surround sound decoding is the RSP1576. Now, I am a firm believer in having a separate processor and amplifier handle all surround sound duties. At least in my ears, it's just cleaner sounding sonically. If you're really serious about this addictive hobby, then I'd recommend you check out going the separates route. So in this video, we're gonna check out the RSP1576 and the RMB1585 together, and I'll share some of my thoughts on how they perform. But first, let's take a quick look at the 1576 and the 1585. The 1576 retails for $2,400, and it sits at the top of Rotel's home theater processors. Inside, we get some documentation and some rack mount screws. Inside the protective foam, we have the rack mounts. I think it's pretty cool they actually supply these instead of making you purchase them at an extra cost. Nice job, Rotel. Here we have an ethernet cable, two sets of RCA cables, two 3.5 to 3.5 millimeter cables, USB-A to USB-B cable, the power cord, and in a separate box, we have the remote control plus batteries. Taking a look at the brushed aluminum front, we have the power button, a USB input, and below that we have an HDMI input, some function buttons, a large LED display with a centrally mounted volume knob, and we have the source selection buttons on the right. Other than that, it's got a pretty clean minimalist look. Around back, we have dual HDMI outputs along with six HDMI ins, three optical and coax inputs, a PC input for playing back digital tracks, an RS-232 port, LAN input, and a bunch of remote triggers. There's two XLR audio inputs next to four analog RCA ins. There's a multi-channel audio input, and then we have pre-outs for all 11 channels, plus two subwoofers and a second center channel. On the right side, we have the main power switch and the power input. So the 1585 retails for $3,000. That's a class AB5 channel amp rated at 200 watts per channel with all channels driven at once. On the front is only a power button and a few vents to dissipate heat. The front panel is brushed aluminum and comes in either silver or the black color that we have here. This is a big amplifier coming in at 79 pounds. It's 17 inches wide by 9 and 3 8 inches high by 17 and 7 8 inches deep. It's big and it's heavy, so if you're going to rack mount this thing, you're going to need a second set of hands. Around back are the exhaust fans, balanced XLRs and unbalanced RCA inputs, the 12 volt trigger and a fan control, and of course the binding post for all five channels. Now for my setup, I'll be pairing this combo with an Oppo 203 4K Blu-ray player and an Apple TV 4K for all my movie watching. For speakers, I'll be using the Arendel Sound 1723S THX speakers in a full 7.1.4 setup. If you guys haven't heard of the speaker brand before, then I'll leave a link for the review at the end of the video. Alright, let's take a quick look at some of the menu options in the 1576. Alright, here's the main menu. Let's take a look at the input setup. In this section, you can rename your input selections and you can specify what type of audio goes to which input. Here you can see the default selections. You have audio delay adjustment and fixed volume. Under audio configuration, this is where you'll specify your speaker layout. You have 7.1.4, 5.1.2, 5.1.4, and so on. For speaker configuration, this is where you select what size speakers you've got. You can select either small or large, or if you're not running a center channel, you can select none. 
but for my setup, I just chose small for everything. Under Advanced Speaker Setup, this is where you're going to select your crossover points for each group of speakers. For speaker distance, you can specify in quarter increments, so it's not quite as granular as, say, Marantz or Denon receivers and pre-pros. Here's the subwoofer setup, which is basically the subwoofer default volume per audio format. Speaker level setup should be pretty self-explanatory. You can adjust in 0.5 increments. Now we're on to the video setup. For standby video source, you can specify which input is still active while the processor is turned off. The rest of the stuff is pretty easy to follow. Here's the PEQ configuration. As you can see, each channel gets 10 bands of EQ. You can adjust Q and gain. So instead of having automatic room correction, you can take measurements yourself and adjust the equalizers. If you don't have the correct hardware and software, then I wouldn't recommend messing around with any of this. The rest of the menu is all pretty basic stuff. I know, you're probably thinking this is the oldest looking user interface you've seen in quite some time. And where are all the music streaming apps? Is there wireless multi-room capability? Where's the dedicated control app? Is there even voice integration? And of course, where's the room correction? Okay, okay, you're right. This is a very bare bones processor. There's no bells and whistles at all. I think you'll find as you start moving into the separates route, especially in the higher end, more niche brands, you'll see there's almost no added features, which to me is totally fine. I'd rather have a pre-pro that just specializes in one area. That's the sound quality. Now, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't totally blown away by the sound signature of the Rotel right out of the box. If I had to compare it to another processor that really didn't do it for me, it'd have to be the Morant 8805. And that will cost two grand more than the Rotel. The 1576, much like the 8805, leaned more on the warmer side. Meaning those crispy high-end details that I've heard time and time again in all these movie soundtracks, they were just a bit softer than I'd like. It was also missing that extra sense of air around my speakers that I was used to hearing coming from processors like the NAD M17 and even the Integra DRC R1. That sense of space that makes your room seem to disappear was lacking with the Rotel. I also suppose that if you've got some bright sounding speakers in your setup, then the warmer sound that I was hearing may very well work better for that scenario. Now, one of the reasons I've held off on this review for so long was I was hearing rumors that this was getting a direct live room correction update. I mean, for a processor that cost over two grand, you'd think it would have launched with some kind of room correction out of the box. I mean, even the low-end Denon receivers have Odyssey. If you remember when going through the settings, there is a 10-band PEQ for each channel. So if you're adventurous or just knowledgeable on how to adjust the equalizer settings, then you can start fine-tuning this thing to give it more life. I ended up using the U-Mic 1 with REW to take some measurements and smooth out my room's response. So after a couple hours running sweeps, I was able to bring some of that extra detail to the sound that I was used to hearing from the other pre-pros. Now I'm no professional sound calibrator, but I did like what I ended up with after running Room EQ Wizard. Oh, and I should also mention that my subwoofer is the SVS PB16, which also has its own PEQ settings. So I had to spend some time adjusting that one as well. The movie started having more detail than what I was getting straight out of the box, and I was able to get a bit more chesty mid-range presence. Prior to adjusting the EQ, I wasn't getting that oomph when I watched the movie with explosions, especially in my front three channels. After EQ, I got some more of that weight back, so explosions and deep voices had more of that weighty presence that I'm used to hearing. As far as Atmos and DTSX soundtracks, I wasn't getting the best discrete effects that I've heard from more expensive processors. And what I mean by that is my high speakers just didn't sound as localizable as I know they can be. I'm sure I could have done a better job of EQing them, but they just seemed a bit lifeless. Things like rain in the funeral scene in John Wick, or when Kong is moving above your head and about to step on these guys right here, just wasn't as easy to hear without actually trying to listen for it. If I didn't know there was something happening up top, then I wouldn't have even noticed. Again, I'm sure I could have messed around with the PEQ some more, but uh, I just didn't do that. Now, don't get me wrong, the processor definitely puts sounds where I know they should be, and they're totally there. It just doesn't make my height speaker sound as good as what I've heard from other processors. With that being said, for pure surround sound and development, up top and within the lower channels, sound movement was spot on. 
The helicopter and the Dolby Atmos demo encircle the entire listening space with seamless speaker-to-speaker -speaker panning, so audio transitions amongst channels were totally fine. Now for the RMB1585 amplifier. This thing is just a beast. If I was to compare it to some other amps that I've had in here recently, like the Emotiva XPA11, I'd say it stomps all over it. I know the 1585 is a 5-channel and the Emotiva is an 11-channel amp. For the Rotel, it's just got more visceral impact when cranking up the volume while still remaining clean and uncongested. To me, the XPA11 sounded strained when pushed to higher volumes, which I attribute to having only 65 watts per channel for the surrounds. I think a fairer comparison would be the Outlaw 7220, which is a 7 channel amp and kind of a neutral sounding amp too. The 1585's got a very slight warmth to it, which I'm sure is what I'm hearing through the 1576 Prepro. I think the warmer nature of both these together might be keeping that extra bit of sparkle on the high end from coming through. But when I had paired the 1585 with other processors that I've had in here, there was a clean air of detailed refinement with not only movie soundtracks, but with music too. When I ran the system without a subwoofer and all channels set as large, there was zero lack of dynamics. Bass notes hit hard with controlled mid-bass slam and a very detailed top end. It's not the most musical amp that I've heard, but for surround sound duties, this thing's tough to beat. As for the pairing with the 1576, I actually preferred it with the Emotiva for the front three channels. I kept hearing a little bit more on the top end with that combo. Now, just a couple more things to mention about the processor. As for the surround sound up mixing, I know a lot of folks like to overlay DTS Neural X over Dolby 5.1 or 7.1 mixes, and you can do that here and vice versa. So if you're watching a 5.1 or 7.1 DTS mix, you can use the Dolby Surround up mixer with it as well. I believe in certain receivers and processors you can't cross mix, so no Dolby with DTS up mixing and no DTS with Dolby up mixing. It'd have to be either Dolby with Dolby or DTS with DTS Neural X. Another thing that I've noticed is that I wasn't able to up mix with the Apple TV's PCM 5.1 audio tracks. If I tried to apply Dolby Surround or DTS Neural X, then I'd just end up with some garbled sound. So you have to listen to Apple TV as source direct. Maybe Rotel can update this with a firmware update, along with that direct live room correction update. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. For me personally, I liked the 1576, but I didn't love it. Especially right out of the box, I didn't love it. I think if you're a real enthusiast and don't mind spending the time dialing in the equalizer or maybe paying someone else to do it for you, you may end up really enjoying this. It's a very simple processor with no added frills. Its main goal is just to sound good, and it sounds $2,000 good. I'm still confused as to why their high-end amplifiers have XLR inputs, but their flagship processor doesn't. Eh, it is what it is. For the 1585 amplifier, this guy will have a permanent place in my rack for the time being. I'm not the biggest fan of these two paired together, but for just an amplifier by itself, this thing has got more dynamics than I can see myself ever needing in my space. It's clean, it's quiet, it does a great job for music, and even better for movies. It's 200 watts per channel, all channels driven, so it should be able to drive even the largest home theaters out there. So those are my thoughts on this Rotel combo. If you guys have any Rotel gear or are thinking about upgrading, let us know down below in the comments what you've got and what you plan on getting. Now if you found this video useful, be sure to give it a like as it really does help out the channel. If you want, you can follow us on social media, and if you want to help keep these videos coming, then stop by our Patreon page. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys again in the next video.